I came from Cambodia. Uh, I arrived in the United States when I was, I think, roughly three years old. And that was in um, April 28, 1978, is when my family arrived. Yeah, so we came during the what they called the genocide era in Cambodia. This is where at least 20% of the country had been slaughtered by dictatorship rule ruler named Pol Pot. Um, so my family fled to, at that time, it was refugee camps that were set up by the United Nations. So when we were there, you have to submit your name. And kind of it's a lottery uh, in a sense where I think that back then it was called a lottery visa. And it's still today, no, there is something called diversity lottery visa that the United States gives out. But there are, uh, as my parents described them to me, bowls of uh, with a country's name. So there's a bowl for France. There was a bowl for the United States. There was a bowl for Australia. And refugees would just put their names into these bowls. And then they, you know, they would be called. And so my aunt uh, and I think two of my father's brothers uh, got Australia. Uh, and my mother's um, oldest sister got France. And our family got the United States. And so initially my parents were very bummed that uh, they got the United States because they wanted to obviously be with their family. Uh, so wanted to go to Australia or France but they didn't realize what an amazing blessing it was that we were chosen um, to go to the United States. To get to these refugee camps, um, you have to go through a boat. And so really it's by pure luck that some of these refugees make it because the Khmer Rouge, who essentially are the guerrilla group that took over Cambodia, they would have boats of their own to intercept these refugees and essentially tried to slaughter them and slaughter as many as they could before reaching the refugee camps. There was not much in terms of military force that uh, could stop the guerrilla group. I think at the time politics got in its way and um, a lot of the countries just did not want to start um, accelerating a war that they knew was already getting out of control. So a lot of the Cambodians, um, civilians had to fend for themselves. Um, and so when we initially um, gathered as a family, we lived out in a village uh, that was near one of these um, opportunities to get onto boats. And my, my mom's parents, so my grandparents on my mom's side and on my father's side, they were all onto one boat and we were all supposed to go together. But at this point, my mom's youngest sister, uh, she fell in love with a guy and she did not want to leave him. So my mother told her parents and some of her siblings and my father's siblings to go so she could try to convince her sister to leave with us. So their boat left. My mom was not able to convince her sister. So we got onto a boat. Their boat, my grandparents never made it. We didn't know that until we got to the refugee camp. My mother, still to this day, I think, feels very guilty that she had her parents and my father's parents go into that boat and not just wait with us. But we barely made it to the boat that we had because it was over overfilled with refugees trying to just escape. And so when we got onto the boat, it took almost three days to get to um, the refugee camp and something happened and I fell off the boat uh, and everybody was yelling, just leave her, just leave her. Because again, the less people on the boat, the faster the boat can move. And my father didn't want to do that. So he jumped in um, and by the time we had gotten to the refugee camp, um, I, I wasn't breathing. Uh, and so the whole concept of CPR and all that stuff, uh, you know, really wasn't, I think, on my parents' um, mind to try to do the whole res resuscitation. And so I, my parents said that they immediately um, had somebody take them to 
this white, they remember this white tent with a red cross and um, obviously it was a medic tent. And so my parents, unfortunately through, I think lost in translation, were, were told that um, I would not be developmentally like other children my age because um, I hadn't breathed for a while and didn't have any oxygen to my brain. So. I think um, from that time, they always kind of looked at me as somebody um, who was going to have some neural development problems as I grew up. Um, and sometimes when we label our children a certain way, we have um, ideas or expectations of how that child will turn out. And we, we sometimes do a disservice on our kiddos when we you know label them as being development delayed or whatever term you want to use on that. So, uh, you know, when we got to the, to the United States, once you're at these refugee camps, they then put you on a plane. Uh, and again, these are refugees who've never experienced anything like this. Um, and so then we arrived initially in LA and um, who ended up sponsoring this was a church uh, out in Westland, Oregon. Um, it was a Baptist church, and so we um, stayed, and I grew up in, in West Lynn. And during that time uh, in West Lynn, we were the only minority family. Uh, there were no other blacks, there were no Asians, um, no African, you know, like no Indian descent. We were the only minority family. and. I reflect on that time because despite the color of my skin, despite the different foods that my family ate, they really embraced us. I did not think that the color of my skin um, was a negative thing at all. It wasn't until I got into college uh, that it was the first time I've I think I experienced racism. Um, it, racism in, in the sense where somebody was judging me because of the color of my skin and would make comments about that. Um, so I was, I lived a very sheltered, blessed life. Um, and I'm not sure if that's a, a good thing or a bad thing in that um, not sure I was completely prepared uh, for when people asked me questions related to the color of my skin or treated me in a certain way because of the color of my skin or because of the race I come from, which is Asian. As a side job, I uh, started working in a law firm and it was initially as a legal assistant slash secretary and then I started doing a lot of paralegal type work. And I realized at that point that I was like a mini attorney, but I obviously didn't have a license. So when the romantic relationship didn't work out, uh, the boss I had at that time said, why, why don't you just go to law school? You know, you, you've you been doing everything like an attorney would, uh, you should go. And so I did. And that's uh, the best advice and the best decision I, I ever made. Yeah, so when I first graduated from law school, I went to law school down at University of Arizona. I knew I wanted to come back to the Pacific Northwest but I didn't want to go back to Oregon, which is where I grew up, because um, I wanted to have some separation with, with immediate family. So I got a job in Spokane, Washington. And while I was in Spokane, 9-11 happened. And at the time I was dating um, a Border Patrol agent and they created the air marshal program. And then he got a job at the SeaTac airport as an air marshal. So I, basically quit my job in Spokane and came over to um, the west side of the state and uh, interviewed with different firms and got a job with the law firm Davies Pearson here in Tacoma. And so I stayed most of the time with that firm here in Tacoma and um, just recently switched to an all injury uh, firm called Rush Hanula Harkins and Kyler which is also a Tacoma-based firm. And so that's where my my legal roots have um, fostered from is Tacoma, Washington since 2000. Probably four or five years into my career that I started to look into immigration law. And I decided to do a pro bono case involving um, 
a young woman from Sudan who actually lived out in a tribe. So I took on an asylum case, uh, pro bono, not even knowing what I was doing, but I researched uh, everything I possibly could about asylum law, about the United States regulations, the requirements. Um, and it was a case where at that time, you know, in the early 2000s, uh, the United States, uh, so it was called INS, Immigration National Services, now USCIS, did not recognize um, females that come from these tribes that uh, at a very, very young age, the moment they get their um, women, period, they then have to undergo what we call female genital mutilation. Essentially, they uh, are sewn in their private area to make sure that they uh, are virgins by the time they you know, meet their husband. And if you can conceptualize uh, what the female body has to endure, particularly somebody that young, whether it be 10 years old, 11, 12, 13, to me, that's torture. And so uh, she had undergone that. And we argued that uh, she'd been tortured in her home country. And if she goes back, she'll most likely be killed. So uh, we initially had a mini immigration trial uh, here in Seattle and uh, we lost. The court did not see her as a member of a particular party. They did not see um, that that was categorized uh, as a protected class. So we appealed it uh, to the Board of Immigration Appeals and we lost that. That's an administrative appeal. And then we appealed it to the court, uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. That's part of the circuit court that um, Washington State uh, is a part of. I want to say at least a year, year and a half later, after we uh, submitted our briefs to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, we got a decision from the Ninth Circuit and they found that it was a protected class. And it was like an amazing feeling to finally just see this young woman be recognized that what she'd gone through was torture. And I think that was such a motivating moment for me that I realized I got to get out of this insurance defense. I got to start helping people like her um, start a new life in the United States. So that's really catapulted me into getting to immigration law. And I've been doing it, gosh, I think I'm into my 20th year now. And it's it's been incredibly rewarding. People ask me all the time uh, what keeps me going, what drives me to still be in the area of practicing law, and it really is the clients um, trying to find justice for them, trying to help them get uh, an opportunity to start a new life, build a family in the United States like I was given. So it's very rewarding, uh, to say the least, of, of the opportunity I've been given to you know practice law and help these people. Yeah, so you know. Um, a nonprofit agency like uh, the ones that helped my parents back in Oregon, you know, at that time they were called Office of Refugee Resettlement. Uh, so these are nonprofit groups that help immigrants kind of acclimate into the American culture. They help them uh, find classes that are English as a second language. Uh, they help them find um, vocational training, whether it be welding, whether it be assembly line work, and kind of teach them how to be able to do simplified type jobs. And then they also um, help where there's local food banks that um, they would provide foods to refugee families. So I wanted to give back to an agency like that. Um, and when I got to Tacoma, there was the Tacoma Community House. Uh, and that's where I really just got more involved in Tacoma. I became one of the board members there. And the Tacoma Community House, they had an immigration service department that would uh, provide immigration services for for pro bono and, and or very low fees. But they also um, really focused on just helping refugees um, get back into the workforce and teach them that way. In Cambodia, there are still, they well, they're considered monuments um, 
now in Cambodia and what I talk about monuments, there's the killing field uh, in Cambodia, which we went out to visit. And in the killing field during the genocide, Pol Pot and his regime would uh, round up, you know, the Cambodian civilians and would take them to these killing fields and essentially just kill them there, hundreds of thousands. So when you go to the killing fields now, even today in 2022, when you walk through these fields, you are walking and you can see it uh, over bones, uh, teeth, uh, human remains all around you. It's it's a surreal experience. Uh, and I, uh, it's hard not to be transported back to what had happened during that time and all the lives and the people that were affected by it. So the Killing Fields is in, still in Cambodia and they consider this a, a museum. And I had, uh, you know, mixed feelings about that because a part of me uh, didn't think we should be highlighting as if this is some cool thing to go in and, and visit and experience because these are people's lives uh, that were tortured and killed here. But it also keeps uh, the memory alive. And it keeps that topic about genocide, about refugees alive. And if that's gonna make some changes in the world, then let's call them museums. The other one is the Tulum uh, Museum that's downtown Phnom Penh. So Phnom Penh is, one, is the main capital of Cambodia. And in this museum, there are still bones and skeletal remains um, that are in a portion of that museum, but then there's rows and rows, and we're talking at least four or five rooms of um, photos of people that the Cameroons had taken before they killed them. And so this was essentially another torture slash killing um, prison. And I remember when I was just walking through, just looking at the different photos and faces, I had heard the scream and it was my mother. And she had found uh, her neighbor slash nanny's photo. And this is in 2009 uh, and seen it for the first time, which obviously has confirmed um, that she was killed there. Uh, so that really was a moving time for me because it was a personal connection, you know, I think for survivors of the um, genocide, like my mother, there's still always this kind of hope that people you know, people you care about survived because no word has come back, no remains have come back to identify that they've actually been killed. And sometimes um, that hope, um, you know, is a good feeling. But then when in this situation where my mom has now seen the photo of someone she cared about, the reality hits that obviously they're, they're, they're dead, they've been tortured. And um, so the trauma, the PTSD of that, I'm sure came back uh, tenfold on her. And I felt really sad for my mom, but I also uh, had hoped that maybe this will give her some closure. Um, and so it's a good and bad thing to go back and visit, uh, because obviously it brings back bad memories, particularly for my parents, but it also is a healing, uh, moment too. And it was so emotional for me that I have not been back, uh, since 2009. And I hope to someday, you know, take my kids and my husband there, uh, but not yet. So it's hard to to reflect back on that time because I I look at where we are today and what I mean by that is is Ukraine and the refugees and each time I see and I hear about refugees um, my heart breaks for them and I look back and the struggles that my parents uh, went through and I, I'm blessed to have been young because I can't imagine the trauma that stays with them. I mean, they've lived it, they've experienced it. Um, and, you know, being so young, I don't have a lot of memory about it. 
Um, and it was easier for me to kind of just acclimate myself um, to the United States. And I, I really do feel like I'm an American uh, in all aspects. So I'm a Cambodian American um, because I still embrace some of my Cambodian roots, but also uh, really culturally, this is the only country I've ever lived in and consider this a birth country to me because I was so, so young when we got here. Don't shy away from asking for help. Um, you know, working with immigrants both in the legal field uh, and um, in my volunteer time, they're incredibly proud people. Um, sometimes their pride gets in the way and they don't ask for help when um, help can easily be given to them. So to all my immigrant friends, um, please ask for the help because um, without help, my family wouldn't have survived and made it uh, to where we are today. Without help, I wouldn't have been able to um, go to college um, and be able to you know, become an attorney and give back to my community. Because um, I think that's the ultimate goal. When people help refugees, when people help immigrants, there is um, this, this feeling of wanting to make sure that it gets passed on. Or I would hope that that's the feeling of why people volunteer their time and give to others is to make sure it gets passed on. You know, hopefully the, the goodness and um, the charity that we provide other people will motivate them to do that when they're able to do it um, in the future. And that's what I hope to you know do for other people like my family because without somebody like me who's in a um, financially stable position to do it um, that I can help make a difference in somebody else's life because they made a difference in mine so hopefully you know it gets passed on